Good evening. Welcome. My name is Marlis Lean. I am the adult programming librarian here at the Council Plus Public Library. Through an email promoting herself to our library, I learned of this author, Susan Stein from Omaha. The topic intrigued me and I pursued it, which resulted in the program that we are about to participate in this evening. Susan Stein is an author and an educator with much of her career having been spent at the Creighton Preparatory School in Omaha, Nebraska, where she also held the position of the department chair in the English department. She's also a prolific writer and editor. You may have read, remember reading her column called Coffee Break uh, from the Omaha World Herald. Well, tonight, Susan is going to share with us about the biography she wrote of the US Foreign Service officer who also served in World War I is named Robert Whitney Embry, and how he was killed in 1924 by a mob in Tehran, Iran. If you have questions either here in the room or virtually, please post them in your chat or Q&A session, and there'll be time for those questions and comments at the end of her presentation. And now, give me just a moment to switch gears here. Please welcome in joining me Tonight, with her presentation, Susan Stein. Thank you, Marlis. Um, I would like to thank the Council Bluffs Library and Marlis Leon for uh, allowing me to talk with you and tell you about Robert Embry's story. And thank you for those who are here in person on a cold night and uh, all those on Zoom as well. We often go back to the overthrow of uh, Mohammed pa uh, Pahlavi uh, in 1979, uh, but uh, to understand American Iranian relationships. But I think we need to go back further than that, further even than 1953, when Mossadegh was removed from his position as prime minister, uh, back to the 20s. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, Robert Whitney Embry was an adventurer, but adventuresomeness, as G. Howland Shaw writes, is not irresponsibility or vagabondage. It is a zest for living and learning, a constructive discontent and restlessness an impatient desire to grow. That's Embry. Embry was orphaned at age 13, but he was fortunate in that his father in his long illness, which I think occurred because of his service in the Civil War, he was in the Union Army. Uh, he had time to plan for his son's uh, life without him. And so Embry, moved in with his maternal aunt and her husband, Mary and Charles Fishbaugh, uh, in this house in DuPont Circle, near DuPont Circle in Washington, DC. And it became his address for the rest of his life, no matter, as he moved around uh, the um, world, this was always his home to come to. He probably wrote his memoir of his time in World War I uh, at this house. He, he was very fortunate. He had a good education. He went to friend school. Um, the Obama daughters went there, so you may be familiar with that school. He went to George Washington University, and then he got his law degree at uh, Yale. He loved to travel. As uh, soon as he graduated from uh, law school, he went to Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. He had um, already been canoeing in uh, Canada. And uh, he didn't take a corporate job. His best friend did take a corporate job after graduation. Instead, he went to work for the Legal Aid Society in New York City. And he worked with sailors. Uh, who were being victimized. Uh, 
he had two assistants and the three of them handled about 200 cases a month for these sailors. And so um, he, I think he shows early on an adventuresomeness and also a humanitarian aspect of, of him that follows him throughout his career. After he did that for about a year living in New York City, he went to Baltimore and opened up an Admiralty Law, it's a port city, an Admiralty Law uh, firm and continued his traveling. And as much as he could, he would go to, he went to France and Ireland and Scotland and England, uh, Italy, and, uh, and he went to Africa. He went to Gabon and he had hoped to go with Theodore Roosevelt on his safari, uh, and, you know, which was much in the news. And I think probably encouraged him to go the next year on a safari. And the head of what is, has had various names over the years, but the Brock Zoo, very famous zoo in the United States, wanted a gorilla. That was kind of a, an attraction. It's tragic to think about now because they really didn't know how to ship gorillas um, from Africa to the United States. And they would get them here and then they would die. It's, very, it's really sad to read about. Uh, because of the Zoological Society president who wanted the gorilla, uh, he went on this trip with this Richard Garner, who had been to Africa several times. He was a very curious man. And Embry came to realize that really quickly. He thought he could learn to speak to gorillas. And, and this was a time, and he was an early Dr. Doolittle. The first Doolittle books came out in 1920. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe the author of the Doolittle books knew about Garner. But at any rate, uh, he went on this trip and then, um, and then war broke out. And Embry, um, had been to France, he had a great love of France. So he signed up for the uh, ambulance, uh, the American uh, Farm Service, uh, Field Service Ambulance. And this is him arriving in December of 1915. And he is there for 17 months and he's on the front line. There were other people who were there about as long as he was, or maybe a little longer, but a lot of those people had desk jobs. And he was in continuous service um, in this time, sometimes driving as many as 36 hours at a time uh, through mustard gas to get wounded people to hospitals and um, other stations where they could be cared for. It might seem odd that a Yale lawyer would know a lot about taking care of a vehicle. But in this period, um, kind of the early auto age, there weren't very many mechanics. So if something went wrong with your car, you needed to know how to fix it. And Emory was quite taken with motorcycles. So when he was in New York uh, in those early years and in Baltimore, he was tinkering a lot. He also took first aid. So he came with some very practical skills. Um, he went to the Battle of Verdun. He thought he was going to be at the Somme. And right before, they, they had all this huge buildup for the Battle of the Somme. And then right before the battle started, um, his uh, field service group was sent to Verdun. And that's the longest battle of the war. And in October of this year, when he is there, a call goes out for the Army of the Orient. And the word Orient is interesting because it meant Greece. So he goes to Greece and Macedonia. And, and I mean, he knew where he was going, but today we, we would not. Um, we would think it was somewhere else. He goes to Salonika, he gets there uh, with a group of ambulance drivers, uh, his tent mate, 
dies almost immediately in a car accident. Really a, a tragic, sad story. He had had to drop out of Harvard because he couldn't pay tuition when his dad died. And he ended up as an ambulance driver. Um, so he's in the Battle of Verdun. And um, in, uh, in the Orient, he comes into Salonika. And he's mostly where that blue star, is, that blue arrow is. He's mostly in that area of Monastir. And Monastir was uh, hard fought for. And sometimes they would have to drive their uh, ambulances to pick up the wounded at night without headlights. And you know, we had one driver walking in front of the car and um, feeling his way to let the driver know how far they could go. So it was very dangerous. He did go into Albania, ran into a man, an Albanian who'd come back home, but had worked in the barbershop down the street um, from where he was at Yale in Hartford, Connecticut. So we can wonder whether he did cut Embry's hair at, at one time. He wasn't there very long in Albania and, and his replacement was killed um, in an air bombing. Um, so he really was very lucky to survive. And in April of 1917, the US came into the war. The um, field service was folded into the French army and the drivers came home and Embry was past the age of conscription. So he was 34 at the time, and he had also had a horrible bout of typhus right before that. And so he came home, thought, well, what can I do in terms of service? And he joined the State Department. So this is, now I think we, we have a lot of pictures of trench warfare in our minds because of France. We don't think of the other battle areas so much. Th this is what Embry was up against and um, driving to Monastir to pick up um, the wounded. It, it was phenomenal. And sometimes there would be um, a white horse would be glowing in the moonlight and it would be a carcass. And so they would use that as a guide for driving. But you can see how treacherous it was. His first appointment with the State Department was in St. Petersburg. And uh, this is an aerial view of St. Petersburg. And I'm not sure if I can get the... Um, mouse to cooperate. But what I'll do is start over in the um, right hand corner where it says Stralina. Uh, Embry was in the center of the city where that large church is. Um, so he would sometimes retreat to Stralina. Eventually he went over to Viborg. Um, but I will tell you about that. Um, later. But I wanted you to see how broken up St. Petersburg is with the canals and so on, the bridges. At any rate, um, the Allies and the American legations moved north out of St. Petersburg after Russia and Germany signed a treaty. And um, the Allies and the Americans were concerned that the Germans would come into St. Petersburg and then they would be captured or held hostage. So they moved north, but Embry was sent back and he was the lone US observer in St. Petersburg. And his job was to protect all the stores, the food, the supplies, tons and tons and tons of it that was in the city and also get Americans out. So he would go to the Cheka, which was the secret police, 
And this is a New York cartoon. I wanted to have it in my book, um, but I couldn't uh, work it out. Um, you know how things are with books sometimes, things don't print so well. Um, here he is with Moses Uritsky, who was the head of the Cheka. And he's uh, demanding the release of an American from the Peter and Paul fortress. And he was there repeatedly. He took a stack of visas to um, be stamped by Uritsky. This is late August. Uritsky never is able to deliver, return these visas because he's assassinated. And so then at the same time, Embry gets a call from the Norwegian legation. He said, we understand the Bolsheviks are going to arrest you tomorrow. We need to get you out. We'll bring false papers. We'll pick you up in a car, flying Norwegian flags, and we'll get you out. And so that's what happens. So he flees. He's later tried in absentia and condemned to death. He goes next to Vyborg, which is now a part of Russia, but was at the time Finland. And that's the closest he could get without, you know, to St. Petersburg without being in Russia. So he could follow what was going on. The White Army, which was um, led by uh, Zar former Tsarist officers, was fighting the Red Army or the Bolsheviks. So he was trying to track true movement. Uh, and <clears throat> so he has a whole system of agents and he had information gatherers. They didn't think of themselves as spies. We didn't have a spy agency. We had military intelligence, but we didn't have an OSS yet. We didn't have a CIA yet. All of that came later. Uh, and consuls seemed to be the um, the automatic go-to person because consulates were places where tourists came, where businessmen came. You kind of knew what was going on in the country. And so he was able to get a network going. And so he had, there were very few people who knew his identity, but he would um, have this web working out. Now he lost at least 14 <laughs> of his agents. We don't know if they were killed or if it was just too dangerous and they quit. Um, but he does recount that he had lost 14. So he was trying to keep in touch with um, Estonia, with Moscow, with um, Petrograd. Uh, he was also, besides doing all the consular work and the information gathering work, he was also very involved in humanitarian efforts. And I don't think he's gotten the credit that he deserves for this because one of his messages to the State Department ends up with Herbert Hoover in France and Belgium, who's handling all the American food relief. And, I, and then all of a sudden things break open and the food starts moving into uh, Russia and um, Finland. So you can see on this map the dire situation after World War I as far as food instability and, uh, and the difficulty, even though there was a lot of food in America, it was at a very high price at the time, and there was also a problem just shipping it. So it was a really difficult situation. He worked with uh, YWCA secretaries, which um, were volunteers, and um, there was one, Ebertha Roloff, an unusual name, which is great for a researcher if you're trying to find somebody you don't want like John Snow. Um, but Ebertha Roloff was an amazing woman in her own right. She set up a soup kitchen in Finland, in Viborg, and they, her secretaries and some other Americans gathered together uh, for church services and to go cross-country skiing and things like that. They had a little community. Um, so this gives you an idea 
of the need at this time in this place, tons and tons of food. And of course, what they didn't want is any of these stores to fall into German hands. So, so he's trying to get all of these um, shipments in to take care of the people. And again, it's a very pitiable thing to read about. When the White Army in the northwest of Russia collapsed, uh, Embry wanted to continue following his interest in Russia. So he went home to DC and then was sent to the Crimea. And so before he got to the Crimea, where there was another section of the White Army fighting, uh, that section collapsed as well. So the entire White Army had dissolved and the Bolsheviks were now in power. So he gets to Turkey and instead of going to Crimea, he goes to Constantinople and he doesn't think he's very well used there. Um, I put this map up just so you can see where Embry's gone, the, the burnt orange, the dark red is, um, Turkey and um, let's see. Oh, there's my yeah. Okay, this is Turkey. Um, down here is Greece. While he is in Turkey, he goes all around the Black Sea, and that's interesting to track him there. And then he's also going around this area as well. This is Constantinople here, but he prefers being in this area where he can really find out what's going on with the people. He's a very people person and, and he's, he can work with people of all walks of life. So um, he's there and he, he goes to Anatolia. He is sent there as the lone US observer once again to the new government of modern Turkey. And Mustafa Kemal, called Ataturk, is the founder of modern Turkey. Uh, Embry can't find any place to stay there, so he stays in a railroad car. And it's actually not a bad railroad car. Um, at, at first, it sounds like um, you know, ju just some box car. But then when I read a more detailed description of it, he eventually had a cook and a servant and um, a little grander than I thought at first. There's an article in the National Geographic for October of 1924. It was published the, the month after Embry died, and, or the month after he was buried in um, Washington, DC. So he had been buried in Persia, disinterred, and then his body was brought back to the States. This is a picture from that article. He was what we think of as maybe an early photojournalist. He loved taking pictures. He liked writing for travel magazines. He was well known by the National Geographic staff. When you read the article, it sounds just like a travelogue, an exotic place, maybe just a little taste of danger to make it enticing and interesting. But when I look at it again, and when I see where he was going, he seemed to have been going to every place where there was an Armenian slaughter by the Turks. And checking all of those places out at the same time that the British have a commission to check out the Armenian genocide as well. The Armenian Americans were very vocal about trying to get the US to do something about this. Hundreds of letters came into the State Department. While Embry was there, he met a woman who was with the um, Near East Relief Service. She was uh, born in a mill town in Massachusetts, didn't want to work in a mill factory, reinvented herself, became a buyer for jewelry in Boston. And when the appeal went out to have 
uh, Armenian and Greek orphans cared for, she signed up for that. So when she met Embry, she had been in Turkey about two years. And um, they took their friends by surprise. I think this was a whirlwind romance. They were both 40 years old. They got married uh, on December 26th and um, in the Catholic chapel in uh, Istanbul. And he was Presbyterian, she was Catholic. This is a picture of orphans. And it is not a good picture as far as photography, because you kind of have to peer at it and think, what is that? But there was an, in Alexandropol, uh, an abandoned barracks run by the Russians that, you know, they had had this barracks there. They had abandoned it. And there were 31,000 orphans there. And one of Catherine's jobs was to bring 7,000 orphans to Alexandropol. So she was an amazing woman in her own right. After um, the, the Lusane Treaty uh, with Turkey was pretty wrapped up. There was an oil concession they called the Je Chester concession that was pretty wrapped up. I think Embry felt he had done all he could in Turkey and wanted um, new territory. So he was next posted to Persia, which was renamed Iran in 1933. And so he and Catherine go there, they arrive in May, and he is murdered July 18, 1924. Now, he actually should not have been in Tehran. Uh, the council decided he wanted some r and R, went on leave. Embry was asked to fill in temporarily. And so he went there and didn't survive. When he arrives in Persia, it, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of chaos, uh, commercial problems. What is the opium trade? Um, it, it's not being taxed. Um, it's very blatant and out there. One shipment of opium uh, had a uh, cavalry really of 126 horsemen transporting the opium. And, uh, but I have concentrated more on the oil interests because I think that uh, is really where Embry's story is. The US, Great Britain and Russia were all competing. And, um, and of course, Persia is not being included in a lot of the conversation. Uh, there are two American companies, Standard and Sinclair and, um, Sinclair is aligning with Russia, Standard is aligning with Great Britain. So here you can see, I, I like this map because the pink is controlled by Britain and the purple is Russia. And you see that Persia is pink and purple. So there's no color for Persia. And you can also see why people want to control that. You know, Britain, Russia. Russia wants it, so they have a way to the Persian Gulf. Uh, Britain is very concerned about Russia coming south and into the Indian Empire. So it's hotly contested. I think even if there weren't any um, oil there. So the typical of Embry, when he would arrive somewhere, he would write a kind of first impression report to the State Department. And he wrote three actually, um, one on each of those topics. Um, but here is a passage from one. The climate of Persia is said to be changing, always favorable to entry. Here two great practitioners of a gentle art, the British and the Bolshevik, find venal fields for the playing of their games. That the American enterprises are serving as the football does not lessen our interest. And I love his little waggish last sentence. Um, he, he was 
humorous. Um, he would often give little zingers. I don't know if they were always appreciated by the State Department, which could be a little stuffy. Um, this is a very famous cartoon. And uh, the British lion is on the left and the Russian bear on the right. And they're pawing the Persian cat. And the Persian cat says, I don't remember having been consulted about this. <laughs> it really caught it. And this was um, in a London uh, newspaper. Um, in, um, there had been persecution of the Jews in Persia. And there were about half of the percent were, of the population were Jewish, but they were very prominent. Um, well-educated, skillful in the merchant class. So um, they were noticeable. And so the US sent the first Jewish ambassador to Persia as a way of affirming the rights of Jews. And so not only is he the first Jewish U.S. ambassador, but he was a rabbi. Now, he had handed in his resignation in January before um, Embry arrived and planned to leave in June, but uh, his leaving was delayed because of Embry's death. I, I feel sorry for him in a way because he found himself in a situation for which he was not prepared at all. He had been the rabbi at a temple in, I think it was Cleveland, it was in Ohio. And here he is, you know, about to leave, about to go home, resume his whole life. And he's suddenly in the middle of a murder investigation. So. Uh, the Packards are uh, a topic in their own right. Harry Henry Packard was in Persia with occasional trips back home from 1906 to 1944. Just amazing. And his wife, Frances, and their four children, this is taken in 1913. She died just a few months after Embry. And she developed heart problems and went very fast. Um, and they bonded with the Embrys immediately. And the two men had already planned a trip, a kind of an exploratory trip uh, into the unknown for the next summer. And on the right-hand side, Dr. Packard is treating a Kurdish chief. Dr. Packard is the one who comes to the hospital after Embry is attacked and he dies that day. And the next day, uh, Packard does his autopsy. And he counted 130 wounds and then he gave up. He said, because the wounds were, you couldn't tell where one stopped and the other started. But that was the best he could do. It's a pretty gruesome um, autopsy to read. Also, as a part of all of the things that are going on in the country is, uh, is political. Reza Khan had uh, participated in a coup in uh, 1921. I, he was uh, intent on becoming the man of power in Persia. And it's my belief that he was mostly in this for himself. There was a very young Shah at the time. Uh, he will be overthrown. Uh, you know, young, spoiled, self-interested, not interested in ruling. So what is gonna happen to Persia? This was the big question. Is it going to be a republic like um, uh, Turkey? Is it going to continue as a monarchy? Is it going to be a theocracy? And at first, Reza Khan is trying to work with the clerics. And their leader is Madaris. Uh, 
I think he understood what Reza Khan was really up to. Eventually, uh, Reza Khan, who becomes Reza um, Shah, will have him under house arrest and he eventually dies, but the, it, it seems that he was poisoned. There's no proof that well could have been. I'd like to look at the situation on the day, and I'm not sure I'm gonna, yeah, here's my cursor. Okay, here is um, the American legation at the top. This is Tehran on the day Embry dies. And he comes down um, from the legation all the way down to the bazaar. And this was typical of Embry. Wherever he was, he went to bazaars because he liked handcrafted things. He liked to meet people. His sword collection is in the Smithsonian now. And there had been a miracle in the bazaar. A man had blasphemed. He had lost his sight. He felt remorse. He did penance. He got his sight back. So people wanted to go to that spot where he was. So there were a lot of people there that day. And Embry comes in with a roustabout, you know, an oil worker, American, who's his companion. Uh, typical of Embry, this man's name is uh, Melvin Seymour, and he thinks that Seymour is suffering from depression. And so he takes him with him a lot. He takes him to the barber shop, you know, with him. And he, you know, so he takes him to the bazaar. And they get there and they get out, and Embry gets his camera out, and someone yells in the crowd and points to Embry. And before you know it, this mob starts to form. He and Melvin Seymour jump into back into the vehicle. And what Embry wanted to do is retrace going just straight north and get to the legation. But what happens is they're in the bazaar and the driver veers off. And they get to this parade ground right by the Cossack barracks. And the Cossack barracks are under the control of Reza Khan. They are pulled from the vehicle. The two men are separated and beaten separately. Um, eventually, the police come in and grab the men and where the green arrow is, take them to the police hospital. The, there's a pause, the mob comes into the hospital and there's several reasons people think Melvin was neglected, um, but they go for Embry and finish him off. They tear up floor tiles and furniture and he's, he's, in, a, he's in bad shape. Harry Packard's servant sees what's going on at the uh, parade grounds and goes and gets Dr. Packard. Dr. Packard shows up at the hospital and <clears throat> uh, Catherine is alerted. She gets to the hospital. She uh, is able to talk to Robert. He's able to talk to her. And then she leaves because she's not feeling well. She's pregnant. And um, at about a week later, she loses the baby, I'm sure, from the stress. And so there are no direct descendants in this family, and she never remarries. Um, but at any rate, so Dr. Packard gets to the hospital and, and treats him, but Emory dies at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is a stunning thing worldwide to happen because foreign service officers were sacrosanct. They were untouchable. And even though there were even rumors at the time that a foreigner would be killed, um, you know, that was kind of perking around. Nobody ever thought 
anybody in the diplomatic service would be killed. So this story is covered from China to India, Russia, London, France. It's in all the newspapers. It's probably in every small mining town newspaper in the United States. And uh, I did try and find it in the Council Bluffs newspaper um, through newspapers.com, but they don't have this year digitized for the non pareil So I'll, I'll try and work on that. Um, the US made five demands, and the most important one is the first one. And that is adequate reparation and prompt punishment for the killers and, and those who allowed the attacks to occur. So this is what President Coolidge said had to happen. The publication, that would be easy if the first one was done. Immediate protection, that was done easily, just posting soldiers. Payment of the expense of the return of Embry's body home, $70,000 that was paid in four installments. I thought that was kind of interesting that the government just didn't cough it all up at once, but they paid it in four installments. And, um, and then due honors awarded Embry, which were very detailed. They brought the body for, on a cortege from Tehran to Baghdad and then south to the Persian Gulf. And the first US uh, battleship uh, to enter the Persian Gulf, came to take his body home. I'll talk a little bit more about this first item um, and, and what went wrong there. You might wonder why he was murdered July 18, when there were rumors that a foreigner might be murdered August 2nd or 3rd. You know, they've been hearing these little rumors. The day before, on the 17th, Dr. Arthur C. Mills Palm met with Reza Khan. Mills Palm was part of the American Finance Mission. And what that was meant to do was to um, bring Persia's budgeting, accounting into the modern world. He wasn't a very good diplomat, but he did know accounting. <laughs> um, he came in and told Reza Khan that he was going to reduce his military budget. And Reza Khan knew that his power relied on the military. So he had to do something. And, and I know we don't have the smoking gun. So please um, recognize that I am drawing conclusions with a caveat. Uh, but I think what happened is that Reza Khan needed to kind of push the envelope. He couldn't afford to have that military budget cut. The day after Embry dies, he declares martial law and that is not lifted till 1926. These two men are put in charge of the investigation. Wallace Smith Murray became the charge de fair. He had been working under um, the um, Rabbi Kornfeld. He became the US ambassador to Iran later on. And the man on the, on the left, uh, Major Sherman Mile, was uh, in Constantinople at the time. He knew the embrace and uh, he was later very involved in intelligence during World War II, very sharp fellow, but in a really difficult circumstances in trying to find out what was going on. Uh, the US Trenton is arriving in the US in this slide. And on the left-hand side is the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, which was Emory's parish church, but it's also the parish for Lincoln. Lincoln's eulogy was read there. And when President Coolidge and Mrs. Coolidge came to Embry's funeral, they sat in the Lincoln pew. 
Uh, this is the um, burial in Arlington of Embry. And Catherine was buried there as well in 1968. She probably, she fought the US government for 25 years on, um, on these demands. You know, you're not doing your job. You need to do your job. And, but she was, she was not able to get satisfaction that way. Um, I wanna go back just quickly to the five demands. Uh, the adequate reparation, uh, Reza Khan offered $250,000 for reparation. The US said, no, we'll take 60,000. <laughs> kind of went in the wrong direction, didn't it? Yeah. The, um, the, the US uh, was afraid that something would happen in the future you know, some other foreign dignitary would be murdered on their grounds. And then there would be a precedent set for the 250,000. So they opted for 60,000. Not too long after Embry's death, there was a murder of a British official in Egypt and Britain demanded 500,000 and it was paid immediately. So this made the US look weak. Um, almost silly, naive. The worst part though, is the prompt punishment for the killers and those who allowed the attacks. There was no civil court at the time. There was a, an ecclesiastical court um, and there was a military court. The mullahs, uh, the clerics allowed the military to handle the trial. The person put in charge of the trial was a lieutenant colonel, which meant he could not bring anything uh, to bear on anyone who was higher than he was. Um, and so the people who were responsible couldn't really be dealt with. There were three people executed and that again is just sad. Two of them were teenagers, and the third one might have been as well. He was a private in the army. Nobody was executed for Embry's murder. They were executed for things like um, inciting a mob, uh, disobeying orders, um, leaving uh, your place of appointment. And so really, bringing punishment to the killers never occurred. And there was one officer uh, in the uh, military who was going to give testimony at the trial, but um, he was so frightened, he was so threatened that he came to Murray in the night and said he could not do that. He was just frantic. The next time he is seen is outside of Tehran's uh, walls, walled city at the time, gates, outside the walls and he's being beaten and he's never seen again. Uh, people came to Murray and said, I'd like to say something, but we've been told our tongues will be cut out if we give any evidence. So it simply wasn't done. Uh, and, and of course that, that was a, a huge problem. So, um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to, to mention about um, Reza Khan. Uh, yes, there is. Um, what he does is he's crowned Shah in 20, 1926 and establishes the Pahlavi dynasty. He starts to get a little cozy with the Germans. He's very taken with autocrats, Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, and so on. So the British uh, have him deposed uh, during World War II, 1941, and his son, Mohammed uh, Pahlavi, is named Shah. He is the one then that is overthrown in 1979, and the um, country becomes a theocracy. There is a brief period of democracy when, and I, I might have a slide. Yes, um, Mossadegh is uh, the prime minister 
He wants to nationalize the Persian oil company. Britain had a contract with Persia, but it was very much in favor of the British and not at all in favor of the Persians and it's their oil. Um, he wanted to nationalize it and the British, uh, I think it's MI5 and the US CIA uh, saw that he was this democratically elected prime minister was overthrown. And he was uh, in prison for I think three years and then in the house arrest for the rest of his life. So then we come to 1979 and the last 40 years in which we've um, been at loggerheads with Iran. And it's very unfortunate because uh, I think we have so much in um, common with Iranians when in 1979, the largest contingent of international students were Iranian. There were 56,000 in the US um, when our embassy was taken over. Um, and so it's tragic that these two countries can't find a common cause. I think the only common cause they have found in those years is when there was, uh, I think Olympic wrestling was going to be uh, eliminated and they were able to come together and be sure that it wasn't eliminated. But surely there are other things we can do um, to reach out. So, um, and, and I do want to mention um, two sources. I don't know what happened at the print there, but the Baskerville Institute is in Utah and it has some wonderful uh, YouTube presentations. Uh, if you just Google it, you will see that. And also Rethinking Iran, which is at the Johns Hopkins School, has some wonderful videos if you, know, you want to have some more presentations. So I didn't want to neglect those two. So I think at this point, I can maybe take some questions. There's currently nothing in chat or Q and A, <laughs> so guys get busy. In the meantime, is there any questions here in the in the room? Maybe while you're thinking, I can tell you um, a little bit about how I came to write the book um, because it's not my area. My um, PhD was in rhetoric and composition, and my master's was in medieval French. Um, so I'm far afield, literally. Um, but I was researching, after I retired, I started researching a man named Bolk Carter, B-O-A-K-E, and he was one of the first news correspondents, um, national news correspondents in the United States. You've probably heard of Walter Winchell. Well, he was a competitor with Walter Winchell. The, pre, the reason you probably don't know his name is that he was an isolationist, much hated by Roosevelt. And, um, and so he, he fell into decline rather quickly once we were into the war. I was interested in him and his father was evidently an uh, oil engineer for a British company in Baku, Azerbaijan. So all of a sudden I'm reading about Baku, Azerbaijan and I run across Embry's name and I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I'd like to read about him. And there was virtually nothing um, about him. So then I just on a hard right and changed my map and went on another journey. So that's a question I sometimes Okay, so get. here's a question. Why couldn't you find out about Embry? What didn't you find out about Embry that you wish you could have found out? Great question, because he had a diary that he kept from 1906 to 1924. And when I got his wife's will and testament, I was so sad that day because she instructed her attorneys to destroy it upon her death. And I just think what a rich resource that would have been. So that is something I would, you know, and then there are 
other, you know, little things. He was in love with a girl and I haven't been able to find her name. I know she was fabulous and wealthy and he didn't think he could give her the lifestyle she was used to. She had her own chauffeur. And, um, and then I just recently came across material that I haven't gotten access to yet. It's in Leeds, England at the university there. But the person who Embry left behind in St. Petersburg was a Russian woman married to a British. And she's a wonderful name for researchers. Zenaida Mackenzie Kennedy. And she ran the agents in St. Petersburg after he left, she eventually was arrested. And I think the only reason she wasn't executed is she was married to a Brit. So, but anyway, I just found her papers about a month ago. And they're in Leeds in the Russian archive there, her passports, her marriage certificate. And I'm very excited about that. Okay, somebody shared, thank you for the fascinating idea, details and slides. Then um, here's another question. How was the book received by other experts on Embry, particularly members of the State Department? I did give a talk to the State Department in January. It had to be virtual and I was sorry in that, you know, I had planned to be there in person. Thank you, COVID. Um, <laughs> but it was part of the Ralph Bunch Speaker Series. And the State Department doesn't know about Embry. I mean, you know, his name's on the plaque as they go into work, but you know how that is. You know, you see names and you sail on by. Uh, and um, so they really didn't know about it, but that was interesting in uh, 2012, I believe it was. Uh, there was an article by an Iranian journalist who's a far right journalist. And he said, everybody in Iran knows Embry's story. And I thought, well, if that's true, we're in trouble because not very many people know its story in the US. And really there were only a couple of articles, academic articles about, and focusing on his death. There was virtually nothing about his um, early life and all of these other things. And there was a family that had letters that Embry wrote to his best friend from Yale. And they had stayed in touch throughout the years. And I couldn't get those released. I really wanted to see what's in them. I didn't know if there was anything good in them. But finally, the grandson of Embry's friend wrote and he said, I've talked to family and friends and I realize I'm not the owner of these letters. I'm the custodian. And so then he not only copied every letter, copied every envelope, so I would have a postmark, which was just Ooh. wonderful. So I was delighted to have those. Nice. Okay, next question. Were you able to connect anything you saw back then to today's time or any themes that are reoccurring in foreign affairs? Yes, <laughs> I guess you want more than that, don't you? I think that as I, I mean, I took 12 years working on this book. And so things would happen and I would be researching something. I go, that sounds so contemporary. Um, you know, just our interests in the Middle East and the turmoil, you know, the turmoil then and the turmoil now. And uh, then Benghazi, you know, that was a big thing. And then the death of Iranian nuclear scientists that so many of them have been killed with car bombs and that kind of thing. And so time and again, there would be something that applied to today and just made this scene now. You know, it wasn't like I was doing ancient history at all. Um, even when we had the, um, Kabul uh, incident earlier this year, and we tried to have the evacuation. It made me think of uh, Embry trying to get people out of St. Petersburg. And no matter how well you plan or 
or when he was in Tehran and they thought there would be something happening in August and then it was July. Um, and and I, I'm now drawing a conclusion on the evacuation one way or the other, and it was certainly sad. And um, I talked to a man who just two weeks ago, uh, who was trying to get out of Afghanistan and he was behind the gate and trying to appeal to the Americans. He had his Nebraska driver's license. That's what he was showing them because he was a, a professor at UNO. And uh, but it, you know, it made me think of um, really different aspects of the Embry's life. So yeah, I just think it very time. And also, um, the, I, I don't know if you know this, but the Americans provided 80% of the petroleum that was used by the Allies in World War I. And at the end of the war, France and Britain and everybody did not want that reliance on the US. And there was going to be another war. You know, people that were in the know were prepping for it. And so the U.S. had also concluded, I think this is interesting, that they only had 30 years left of oil reserves in the U.S. And they too needed to do something about it. Um, so just all of this concern about OPEC today and where do we get our oil? So, yeah. Okay. okay. Then here is a um, thank you. Um, it was a great webinar. This era makes me also think of Riley Ace of Spies. Yes. Do you think Embry had any contact with British spies? Oh, yes, um, he did. And Sidney Riley was in Russia at the same time. Uh, Sidney Riley was um, a really curious character. He's very hard to pin down. And psychologically, he's really an unusual person. Not very reliable as a spy. You uh, <laughs> want to know <laughs> what side people are on. Um, more interesting to me was um, a man named Kwame. Um, I have to, let me look up really quickly. I should know his um, first name um, for sure. But since I've lived with these people for so many years, um, yeah, Francis, uh, Francis Crommy, he was a, a naval commander. He had ships uh, outside of Kronstadt during World War I. Uh, and when Russia and Germany decided that they could come to some accord, he was told that he had to um, turn over all his ships to Germany. That would be part of the deal. He scuttled everything. And then he goes to work in the British embassy in um, not far away at all from where Emory's working. And they become good friends. And he, he's, he has his own book written about him. He's really interesting. Sadly, and this is amazing, the Norwegians have Embry in their car. They are stopped by soldiers, Bolshevik soldiers. The British are being marched out of their embassy to be taken to Peter and Paul Fortress. Krami has already been killed. When the Bolsheviks came into the embassy, he pulled out his gun and he was shot to death. And uh, what an interesting man he is himself. And so, you know, I look at Sidney Riley, I think of him more of an adventurer, and I don't know if he really had um, a moral center, <laughs> but somebody like Crom really did. So, and then, you know, what is really interesting too, I think it's after Sidney Riley leaves, um, the British send in a concert pianist whose last name is Duke. He had studied in Russia and they needed somebody to run the spy ring. So they send in a concert pianist, of course, of course. 
And, you know, sometimes doing the research, it's interesting, you feel it's almost like a repertoire theater with only a set number of actors playing all the roles because names reappear and reappear. Uh -huh. And so when Embry is first in Istanbul, Alan Dulles is there. You know, Alan Dulles becomes the first director of the CIA. And Alan Dulles is in charge of the Middle East section of the State Department when Embry is killed. And so these names keep reappearing, and that's really interesting too. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was a good question, you know. <laughs> it's fun to read about. Okay. Riley. Any other questions, either with our virtual audience or here in the room? So it looks like we are coming to a close. Mm -hmm. And I want to say thank you so much thank to you. you for your presentation this evening, for helping us understand a little piece of US history and challenging us to read more on it by reading her book. For those of you that are here in the room, if you haven't got a copy, she's got a couple on the back table that you can buy, or you can have your copy signed if you already own one. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you online, I suggest you check with Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or your local bookstore, not to, to, to put aside the local bookstores. We have um, a copy here. Uh, so, thank you. 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 Thank you.